Justin is the education reporter for the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle, so most of you probably know him in some way or another. He's worked there since 2012. He's written extensively, this is coming and going, about school districts in both Rochester and the surrounding areas, and he's won several awards for his work, and his recent book is really a good overview that it informs all of what we're doing today. Keisha James will focus on the present. She's co-director of our local history and an educational leader on that and teacher. She's also a marriage and family therapist, so she brings the knowledge about being together on an individual basis for how we can affect our institutions locally. She worked for more than 15 years with children and families that were impacted by trauma. <laughs> schools and local organizations like all of us to help attain more equitable and just communities. Please join me in welcoming Justin and Alicia. sound guy is it okay that um, we're using the mic and you're okay good thanks um, Keisha and I are really honored to be here it's it's really striking and meaningful um, that not just one organization but several organizations came together to, to organize this event I think that really speaks to the the, the broad importance of, of the topic. And in particular, it's, it's really an honor to be here at, at AME Zion Church, which we're certainly um, familiar with the importance of this place throughout um, Rochester's history. Uh, as Judy said, I'm an education reporter at the DNC, and, and kind of my <clears throat> main qualification for being here is, is the book and the research um, that went into it. You can see the tasteful stack over there, and this is my, my dedicated sales team that I bring everywhere. <laughs> um, it, I, I'll have those available for anybody that wants, but I, I started, um, I've been covering education for a long time, and, and the way that the book kind of came about is uh, people, you know, fielding people's ideas about what's wrong with RCSD. What, why can't they ever get it right? And, and people have a lot of theories. It's, it's the teachers union, it's the school board, it's the charter schools, it's whatever. Um, and I, I have um, investigated all of those ideas, I've written about all those ideas, and, and ultimately found them all lacking and in and, and need of historical context. And my, my conclusions in the book are related to segregation and, and how Rochester remains an extremely segregated place. And, and that, that's kind of like a, uh, just an obstacle that we haven't dealt with. And so if you have seen uh, an earlier stop on my uh, world tour, I go through kind of what I write about in the book. Today I want to focus a little bit more closely on um, more like curricular issues and, and what, what black children learning in Rochester looks like and what learning about black history looks like. Uh, and so I'm going to start all the way back at the very beginning uh, with Austin Stewart. And I, I suspect this is too small to read, so I'll, I'll read it for you. Um, uh, this is from Austin. Austin Stewart was like the first prominent black resident of Rochester. He, he uh, emancipated himself from slavery in, I think, 1816, moves to Rochester, opens up a store. Uh, and here he writes in his memoir, In the summer of 1818, I commenced teaching a Sabbath school for the neglected children of our oppressed race. For a while it was well attended, and I hoped to be able to benefit in some measure the poor and despised colored children. But the parents interested themselves very little in the undertaking, and it shortly came to naught. So strong was the prejudice then existing against the colored people that very few of the Negroes seemed to have any courage or ambition to rise from the abject degradation in which the estimation of the white man had placed him. I, f I find it so powerful the way that he phrased it because it, it, it like 
It really just complicates the whole story. And you can think about how a person with a particular point of view could pick out the parts of this that, that fit their narrative of, of what's wrong with, with education or with people's approaches to it or whatever. But um, you know, this is the, the very first time that black children in Rochester have had a chance to go to school of any kind. Um, slavery has not yet been abolished in, Roche in New York, so, so a lot of the students here are, are actually probably may still be enslaved. And so this is like the, the very um, uh, hard and, and admirable and what probably seemed at the moment uh, to be like an insurmountable burden of trying to do just a little bit. And, and that's, that's the, the job that Austin Stewart gives himself. Um, it's, it's most likely that one of his students was another uh, person who, who emancipated himself from slavery at the time, uh, which is Thomas James, who of course founded this church. He says, in 1828, I taught a school for colored children on Favor Street, and I began holding meetings at the same time. In the following year, I first formally commenced preaching, and in 1830, I bought as a site for a religious edifice the lot now occupied by Zion's church. So he's kind of like the founder, you know, after Austin Stewart, of, of this church and, um, and continues doing that like very hard work of people who have been raised in slavery and, and with almost no rights, providing some uh, early minimal education. Um, now I, I mentioned one of the things that I really admire about um, about what our local history, Keisha's organization does, is the way that they make us, they, they complicate our histories. We, we can't just tell a simple story about our past because it's never that simple. Um, and so having just said all these nice things about AME Zion Church, I'm gonna, I'm gonna complicate the history a little bit. Uh, here's Frederick Douglass in 1849. And he says, there can be no reason founded in justice why they, they, black children, should be shut out of the fine, airy schoolhouses of the districts, meaning the public schools, and driven into the damp, dark, and badly ventilated cellar of Zion Church. Now, of course, he wouldn't say this if he had seen this beautiful building. But um, the, So the context, as we know, Frederick Douglass arrived in Rochester in 1847 to open the North Star uh, and on top of that, on top of the million other things he has going on, he's raising his own kids. His, his oldest daughter, Rosetta, is, uh, I don't know, maybe eight or so at that time. Um, and so throughout the, 18, the, the late 1840s and into the 1850s, he is, is trying to find an educational path for his own children in Rochester and, and finds it extremely offensive um, that the, for the most part, the educational opportunities are all segregated. Uh, the, the public schools have some separate uh, schools for black kids. There are one or two, depending on the year. Um, and the, the context for, for this statement is that throughout the 1850s, the, uh, the late 1840s and 1850s, the school district is realizing what everybody who runs a segregated uh, school system eventually realizes, which is that it's by definition like twice as expensive to run two sets of educational systems instead of just the one. Uh, and they are increasingly chafing under the burden of having to rent separate space or, or open a separate school just for the, the black kids. Um, and they're at a point here when there's been a lot of agitation against the segregated school that they're about to kind of give in and say, fine, the black kids can go to school with everybody else. When the uh, Amy Zion steps in and says, well, actually, we'll rent you our basement for like a, a low price. And so they say, oh, great, that's perfect. We'll put the, the black school there. And that just drives Frederick Douglass up the wall. He says he can't believe that uh, the, the trustees would have made that decision. And so that's what he's talking about here. You may know the story of, of uh, Rosetta's education and his own experience. He seeks to send her to a private girls' school, and she's accepted, but then when she gets there, they, they in his words, as he puts it in 
a column that's written, that's published across the country. They, they try to put her into a separate closet and she's not allowed to sit with the other kids. And so he, he you, there are very few worse ideas a person can have than get into a public fight with Frederick Douglass in about 1852 or so, but that's what the school chooses to do. And it goes the way that you can imagine. Um, so, so this is um, like we've kind of taken a step forward from Austin Stewart and Thomas James. Like the, he, obviously Frederick Douglass himself, but the black population in Rochester has a little bit more of a footing than it did back then. Um, and we, we get this question that is going to continue to recur up until the present of kind of the wisdom of segregated versus integrated education. Because there are, there is a, a, a faction of the black community in Rochester that, that says, just like Austin Stewart pointed to, the, the white kids, the white teachers hold us in such low esteem that we would rather be in our own school. And, and of course, we hear echoes of that same argument today. So that, that's the side that Frederick Douglass comes down on. Um, so the, the segregated black school closes in 1856, and, and after that, um, black children are allowed to go to school with everybody else. Um, but it's really, it's almost 100 years, maybe 90 years before the black population really starts to grow very much. So up until 1950, even after World War II, the non-white population of Rochester is still only 2%. Um, and so what kind of develops is we have agreed that black children have a right to education, um, but there's no real uh, appreciation for the need um, to have any, anything what we would call like a culturally responsive curriculum, um, or even to be like sensitive at all to, to their position. And so a good example of that comes almost 100 years later, this is 1951, and the NAACP writes to the school board to ask them to, to take Little Black Sambo off of the curriculum. Uh, they say, um, it strengthens the conclusion among the uninformed and prejudiced that Negroes are all the same, and this type of literature is not good for human relations and democratic principles on which our society is built. Uh, and the superintendent who, I guess his credit says, okay, that's fine, uh, we'll take it out, but we'll take it out if it bothers you, but honestly, I don't really see what the problem is, and everybody kind of likes it, but fine, we'll take it out. And there's like a big backlash of people saying, well, no, actually, Little Black Sambo is a really good role model for everybody, and they should be happy to read this book. And um, it, it shows the way, so there's like some more common themes here, kind of. There's black children are clearly being, at best, ignored. Like, no, nobody's thinking about, geez, what, like, how might one feel if, if that's what you're reading in school? And at the same time, kind of like um, professing to do things in good faith. You know, like, if, if challenged, we'll, we'll do what you say is the right thing to do, but it's not really, like, a, a pressing issue for anybody. Um, that starts to change in Rochester and elsewhere as the Great Migration moves along. Um, and again, it's kind of a question of like the, the political calculus changing. Like there's, there are more black families in Rochester, the political leadership in Rochester is, is increasing in the black community, and questions come to the forefront. Um, and so this is the first time that RCSD has anything resembling a, a curriculum uh, about or for black kids in the district. Uh, this is from 1964. It's called The Negro in American Life. And this introduction is, is an interesting and, and pretty good document. Uh, what I highlighted here, it says, in almost every phase of learning, the impact of what is probably the most significant issue in our country today, the Negro's struggle for equality, has been muted or ignored. And it goes on here to say, Her heroes of eighth grade American history range from colonists to cowboys, but seldom does the Negro appear except as the happy and childlike servant. Um, which is true. That, so that's like, uh, 
this is kind of a big step forward and we can see the, the incremental progress that's, that's being made. Um, a couple years later, and so like for context, this is 1964, this is sort of toward the beginning of the period when the city school district is really having to grapple with the effects of the Great Migration. Uh, the, the black population in certain schools, in particular at School 3 around the corner here, is, is rising very fast and they're having to kind of um, answer for how they handle that. And, and in my book I lay out a lot of examples of, of how the district even beyond what housing segregation requires, um, the district really drives school segregation through its own internal policies. Um, and now we, so we get again what Frederick Douglass pointed out, this sort of conflict between separatism and, and integration. Uh, this is a document from Fight in 1967. Uh, Fight is interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, as you may know, FIGHT, when it's founded in 1965, the acronym stands for Freedom, Integration, God, Honor, Today. Uh, two years later, they change it, the I, from integration to independence. And so they are moving along that path of saying, we tried integration, uh, we were abused and mistreated, and it's, it doesn't seem like it's gonna work, and so we want our own either our own schools or our own control over the segregated schools. So here they're asking for fight wants its own kind of seat at the table in developing curriculum and running these schools. They want uh, Swahili and other African languages offered and they want um, contributions of, of black people to America's growth as an integral part of the social studies and history curriculum. Um, and again this reflects political trends in Rochester and elsewhere. Um, so like as we, what we're still mostly talking about here is the con is, is positive contribution. So like a, a way to satisfy a lot of this is that we would have a lesson on Frederick Douglass and we would read a book by Richard Wright and we would learn about Louis Armstrong and things like that. And especially after the civil rights movement, that's a lot of what, what um, education about black history looks like today is that we kind of admiringly talk about Martin Luther King Jr. and, and things like that. And the, the opposition, the, the fact that they were fighting so hard against something kind of gets ignored. Like things were bad, bad decisions were made, and therefore look at our hero, Martin Luther King Jr., and we don't really get into that, in part because it makes a lot of people uncomfortable, in particular people that look like me uncomfortable sometimes. That is, I, I think, like, um, as we come to the present, a, a really important and exciting place uh, of, of progress, and part of what's drawing a lot of opposition politically right now is um, that we're not only going to look at, at positive contributions that black people have made throughout American history, everybody can do that. Uh, we're not only going to lionize the civil rights struggle, but we're going to ask questions about what they were struggling against in, in what was like the, the mainstream traditional American culture. And we're not only going to say, well, yeah, they were bad back then, like in the 1950s and whatever. Um, but what are the, what are the like core parts of, of, of American culture and us all as people that, that lead to that? Because if, if it's just the case that my grandfather was a racist, but now I know better and everything's cool, well, that's easy. Like, okay, we're done. But it's harder than that, right? And so getting to some of that, like actually examining those dynamics, I think, is a much, it, it's exciting to be able to start doing that and not just um, cherry picking positive stories and kind of skipping over the rest. Um, and that's a, a segue for Keisha because that's exactly what her organization is doing. If you have not seen their lessons in action, it's really exciting, informed, accessible stuff. Um, I think she's going to walk you through some of it now, uh, and it, it's, it's really very cool. So I'm going to hand it over to Keisha. Thank you, Justin. Mm. 
Well, thank you. That was such an important context to really think about uh, the legacy in our community, the history, how we got here. So I'm going to quickly walk through. I don't know how quickly. I'm a teacher, so I over prepped. Uh, you would have thought I was prepping for a three hour presentation, so I'm going to make sure that y'all get the slides um, because I got a little excited and there's a whole bunch of slides in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through a little bit of how our project started. I will talk a little bit about my history here and then I'm going to actually have you participate and do some of the curriculum like students are doing right now. And so you'll actually get an opportunity to see what's happening. So this is our, um, we're hosted over at CCSI. Um, Shane and I run the project together, and Keisha Carter is our Chief Diversity Officer, and then we just um, brought on Tay as a consultant that works full-time with us. Um, I met Shane back in 2019 when he gave a free training for Rochester City School District teachers, and so I was getting my um, administration degree, getting ready to become a principal, and I see this training around redlining and racism in Rochester, and so I signed up because I was interested and I wanted to learn more, and within the first two hours, I was blown away. I remember going to social, uh, the social studies director at the time, Steve Lamort, and I'm like, Steve, where did this guy come from? How did you find him and how do we get him to come back? Because if I've lived in Rochester 30 plus years of my life and I've taught in this district for over a decade and I didn't know this history and I'm getting ready to become a principal, how many other people in this community don't know this history? And how do we get this information out more? And so um, a little bit of my story, born and raised in Rochester, uh, a proud graduate of Rochester City School District. I graduated from Franklin many, many years ago. Um, <laughs> and then um, I, after I graduated from college, I came and I worked in the district for 14 years as an educator. Um, about halfway through my career as a teacher, I went back and got another degree as a marriage and family therapist. I took a little bit of time off from teaching and um, I worked as a full-time therapist at an organization called SPCC the Society for the Protection and Care of Children, um, where I supported families that experience extreme trauma. I am born to be an educator, so it was only one year I was away from the district, and I was like, I gotta go back, like, I need to see my babies, I need to be there, um, and came back into the district, and you know, as I was back in the district, um, just that's when I got to go to the training with Shane. So really excited to share some of this work with you all. Um, I stepped in and started co-leading this project with him in 2021. Our project officially kicked off um, the summer of 2020 when we got a little bit of funding from the local organization, ESL's foundation. And, um, but this work had really started in Shane's classroom about nine, 10 years ago, and it all started because a student said, did Martin Luther King come to Rochester? Did we have a civil rights movement here? And he's like, that's such a great question. I have no idea. I'm gonna go do some research and find out, and I'll get back to you. And truly, the more he brought back information, the more students asked questions. So he's like, I don't know, let me go do <laughs> some more research. Started bringing community members, elders from the community into his classroom to share their stories. Um, and then again, he got um, some funding, worked with some, youth, some teens from um, Teen Empowerment, and we were able to um, really hire this group of teachers right here that has helped to write the different units of study that we have created. Everything that we do is co-authored by elders and youth in our community. So these are just four of the 30 youth that we've worked with um, from Teen Empowerment. And um, as of this fall, I would say as of about right now, we're in about 100 districts across New York State. And anytime we go into a district, we always um, pay teens to review the curriculum for that area and um, give us feedback. What's good, what isn't good, what needs to change, because we truly want it to be something that kids want to learn. And um, so you'll see some students on the bottom in Syracuse that was reviewing some of the Syracuse um, curriculum that we created. So anytime we go into a new area, we do research on their local history and then we adapt our Rochester work to their area. So students all across the state are learning about the local history right in their own community. We have three areas of focus. We work with K-12 schools, we work with all the local schools of education, and then we also do community workshops in, in, um, with organizations like this right here is the um, Greater Rochester Association of Realtors. We work with med students, we work with county workers, we work with church groups, parent groups. Pretty much anyone who lives and works in our community, we think it's important for them to know the history, for them to know what actually happened here, and that we all have a voice and a choice in what is going to happen in the future of our community. 
our practice and the way that our model is, is we are going to do um, restorative practices. So we don't, um, we always check in and see how kids are feeling. And so we'll ask them, what are you noticing? What are you wondering? What feelings are coming up as you look at this information? We never tell kids what to think. Everything is inquiry based. We put primary sources in front of them and we say, what do you notice? What do you wonder? You know, what do you think that this is about? And then all of our units ends with a call to action. We always invite students to say, okay, well, what are the problems that you see today? And what do you wanna do about it? How can we use the strategies from the past? And how can we apply them to the issues that you think are important today? So I'm gonna quickly go through the next few slides, just examples of a couple different units that we have. And then I'm gonna have y'all actually jump in and participate in part of some of this. So we have a brand new second grade unit that is focused on Constance Mitchell, our first black female elected official in Rochester. We, have, um, we wrote a children's book about her life and her deciding to stand up. It was illustrated by Sean Dunwoody and written by local artist Leslie C. Youngblood. And so our focus for second graders is thinking about how our community can be safe, can be kind, and can be fair. For fourth grade, we uh, focus on Dr. Cooper, the Great Migration, and thinking about um, fighting for redlining in Rochester. We also have a fourth and seventh grade unit, which are gonna experience a little bit of this today around enslavement and resistance right here in, in Rochester and New York State. We have a fifth grade Puerto Rican Civil Rights Unit. We have an eighth grade redlining and New Deal unit. And this is all on our website. It's free, it's open sourced. You'll see all the, the student directions, all the teacher directions, all the handouts, all the slides are created for teachers. All they, can do, all they need to do is adapt them for the students in their class if they choose to use this. Did you wanna? We have an 11th grade LGBTQ civil rights in Rochester. We have a 12th grade redlining and civic action in Rochester as well, connecting the past to the present. And this is our website right here. It's called resistancemapping.org. And like I said, on our website, when you click on any of the resources, you'll see there's teacher directions, there's slide decks, and there's student handouts. And they're all editable for teachers. They're free. They don't have to pay anything. There's no password. There's no gatekeeping here. Um, we know how important it is to find high quality resources as educators, and we wanted to make it as easy as possible. There's also maps on our website where students can actually click on and see where Frederick Douglass's home was, find out where the AME Zion Church is, where Austin Stewart's store was. And so they can actually look in where these places were located right within our community. Um, and we also have a documentary that's about 20 minutes long, and it um, highlights uh, local families and students in Rochester City School District around what redlining is right here in the Rochester area. Um, written by, the film was written by Justin, um, narrated by me, um, produced and directed, or directed by Carvin Eisen uh, with July 64. And so we really just wanted to find a lot of different ways to get this information out to the community. We have inquiry questions for all of our units, so what we're gonna focus on is really thinking, how has racism impacted Greater Rochester, and then how have people responded and resisted it? So those two, those two pieces, how do people fight for and against? And then this inquiry question today, I want you to just notice is, what do you notice about how our local histories approach builds common ground, fosters meaningful dialogue, and empowers participants to participate in anti-racist civic action. Anytime we do trainings, we always start with group norms of just how do we wanna have conversations today? We always open it up to folks and say, well, you know, do these norms work for you? Can you speak your truth? Can you use I statements? You know, can you just expect to experience discomfort? Can we respect that everybody's in a different place when it comes to learning about this? All right, so I'm gonna have y'all jump in and participate a little bit. So if you've seen this before, you're gonna pretend this is the very first time and you've never seen it before in your life, all right? And so I want you to think in your head. You don't have to write it down, you don't have to share it. When you hear the word Africa, what's a word, thought, or phrase that pops in your head? So don't share it, just think about it. Does everybody have something? All right, awesome, we're gonna come back to this. With students, we have them notice and wonder this beautiful map of Africa. We give them information that Africa is the second largest continent that all these different countries could fit on the continent of Africa. That's how large it is. 
most of Europe, the United States, China, India, that Africa has 54 countries, that it is not a country, it is a continent. We want students to understand that, very important. And that oftentimes on maps and globes, Africa is depicted much smaller than it actually is. So we wanted to show a more accurate depiction of how large the continent actually is. All right, so here's the good part. So we're gonna do what's called a mystery source. We do, it's, uh, we take an image, we break it up into four parts, and I'm slowly gonna show you piece by piece. I'm not gonna tell you what you're looking at. I'm not gonna tell you if you're right or wrong. I just want you to notice and wonder. So as I get ready to, to go to the next slide, keep these three questions in mind. What are you noticing? What do you wonder? And what inferences or what are you learning about Africa when you look at this? It can be as simple as a color, a shape, a letter, it doesn't matter. Y'all ready? Okay, so take 30 seconds and just take a look at this. What are you noticing? What are you wondering? All right, turn and talk to somebody next to you. What did you notice? What did you wonder? Go ahead and turn and talk. You got the people behind you if you want to partner. So I'd love to hear from a couple folks. Let's bring it back together. Let's come back together in three, in two. Ooh, y'all are good, in one. So I'd love to hear from a couple folks. What did you notice? What did you wonder? Or maybe what's something your neighbor noticed or wondered? Yeah. This? Uh-huh. What do these red lines mean, right? Noticing this can or this structure thing here. I love that, I love that. Who else? What's something y'all noticed or wondered? It's hard to define what this object in the foreground is. Hard to define this one? Yeah. Not sure? Okay. Yeah. To me, it looks like it's a cutout of a larger picture, so you're, you're, you're not going to get the whole. Uh, yep. Absolutely, you're just getting a piece of it, right? Anybody see the kidney bean here? See a little kidney bean? I don't know if it really is, but it looks like that to me. <laughs> I, what I first saw was, it's a throne, and there's somebody sitting on there, and they're covered with a lot of uh, cloth or okay. stuff. This side? Yeah. Thinking this is a throne and someone's sitting on it? Okay. Right here. So this represents some kind of symbol or something like that. I love these inferences, these notice and wonders. All right, no waiting, keep talking. Turn and talk to your neighbor. What are you noticing and wondering now? All right, keep talking. Here's a little more, keep talking. Here's part three. Keep talking to your neighbors. What do you notice, what do you wonder? All right, so let's come back together. I'm gonna to show you the full image, but I'm still not gonna tell you who this is yet, even though some of you might know. Here we go. So here's my question. Now you're looking at all of the parts together, all four pieces. What story is this telling you about Africa? Turn and talk to your neighbors. What story is this telling you about Africa? Turn and talk. Or what questions are coming up? All right, so I'm going through this a little faster than I normally would. I would get, normally give y'all much more time to chat, but I'd love to hear from a couple folks. What, did you, what story do you think this is telling us about Africa or what questions are coming up for you? Yeah. I think it talks about a rich history. 
Yeah, so richness, I'm, I'm seeing the, the gold crown is making me think of that and whatever he's holding in his hand. Mm -hmm. Oh, independence. What else? Oh, maybe is he like the center of knowledge because he's right there in the center of things? Yeah, I like that. I like that. Intelligence. Is there a map behind him? I like that, right? So are we really looking at the whole image or is there more? <laughs> I'm noticing he's how much larger he is than everything else. Right, so think it make, it's making me think he might be important. He's a king, right? So we're noticing the crown on his head, the scepter that he's holding. He's got a pretty full belly right here, you know, eating good. Yeah, what's his role? Thinking about the leadership, thinking about, you know, what we know about this time. Let's take a look at a little bit more. So this one is, this is the Catalan Atlas from 1375, and we've got a little arrow, but this is our mystery man right here that we were just looking at. And we just kind of zoomed into this part, but I also want you to notice the gold route above our mystery man. So this is Emperor Mansa Musa, the richest man to ever live. Um, if what we tell students is imagine the richest person that you know at a couple hundred billion dollars and you have somewhere close to the amount of wealth that Mansa Musa had. Um, he actually took a pilgrimage to Mecca, that's that gold route, and he gave out so much gold that it caused inflation across the entire world at this point. Yep, so thinking about this piece of it. With, with students, we have them guess how much larger the Mali Empire is than what New York State is today. Anybody have a guess? Throw a number out. What you think? Four times. Four times? Twenty. Twenty? Anyone else? All right. So we got, so it was actually, it's actually nine times larger than what New York State is today. The Mali Empire was at its peak. And then with students, we show them this, um, there's a, a short TEDx video, so it's like a video to give them a little bit more background knowledge around who Mansa Musa was, that he built mosques, that he built libraries, that he built some of the largest universities. This is actually a mosque right here. This is a building. Mm -hmm. So is the language Arabic? I'm not sure because the Catalan Atlas is Spanish. So um, whoever created that atlas was Spanish. So I don't know if it's actually Arabic or, that's a really good question though. Um, and then with students, we go a little bit deeper. So we have them partner up and we have them do this three to one partner activity where they work with a partner and they write down three things they notice, two things they wonder, and then an inference of something they can learn about Africa. And so I'll just kind of show you a couple of the images here. So this is one of the mosques or universities that was built under Mansa Musa. It has one of the world's largest libraries. Over 25,000 students attended this university. And then we always pair it with the geographic reasoning to show students where it was located on the continent of Africa, because we want them to understand you know, that geographic location. We got a couple more. So the High Atlas Mountains, this is, like my, this is my favorite picture this whole day. It's these gorgeous, beautiful mountains. Even thinking about some dye pits or medieval cities, or current day cities like Johannesburg, South Africa. And I didn't put all of the pictures in here, I just gave you a few so you can see, but on our website, all the pictures are there. And then we close this day with students where we say, well, when you hear the word Africa now, what's a word, thought, or phrase that pops in your head? We hope that they're gonna talk about richness, about beauty, about kings. We also have a queen with that zoom in, zoom out. We also have a queen that they can also um, do that activity with as well. Um, so we really wanted to make sure we were starting with an asset-based approach. Um, I don't know about your experience, but for me as a student in Rochester City Schools, when it was February, every single year from kindergarten to 12th grade, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and Harriet Tubman. Yeah, so those four each year versus let's start in Africa. Let's start with beauty, with richness, with people who were geniuses, and then we can go into the period of enslavement because black history does not start with the period of enslavement, and we need students to understand that. So I went to a training at UB, and the facilitator, he said something that I will never forget. He said, you never start a people's story at their lowest point, right? And how often does that happen with our education? You never start a people's story at their lowest point. 
And so how do we again start with this beauty, this richness, this diversity, and then we'll go into what happened right here in our community. So that was very intentional on our end when we put this unit together to start here, and then we'll get to what happened when people got on um, this soil, and specifically right here in um, New York State. So I'm gonna really quickly go through what the next day would look like with students. And so their learning target is I can participate in a gallery walk to understand um, what enslavement was like in New York State and how people resisted it. And so um, we start with some vocabulary terms to consider. We shift from the word slave to enslaved person. No one chose to become a slave. It was something done to you. So our definition to consider is individuals forced to work for no pay and without freedom. And then we always pair it with local examples. So Austin Stewart that you learned a little bit about earlier, how he was forced to work for no pay, but also like thinking about the fact that yes, he was enslaved and then he became Rochester's first black business owner. Right? So we want to think about that. We shift from master to enslaver, because master can have this positive connotation, like you've done something well, versus enslaver was a choice. These individuals chose to enslave people, to buy and sell individuals and force them to work for no pay. Daniel Penfield, Horatio Gates, Nathaniel Rochester, they all enslaved people right in this area. Um, so you see there's this um, sculpture of Daniel Penfield in the town of Penfield, yet it makes no mention of the enslaved Africans that actually turned that mill to generate the wealth for this community. And so we have to talk about the legacy here. Henrietta was also an enslaver. She enslaved over 250 people in the Caribbean, um, Mount Morris. We have tons of areas around this, this um, state that are named after people who enslaved other people. And then thinking about, instead of runaway, freedom seeker. And so thinking about you know, someone who risked their lives to escape from enslavement. So like you heard about Thomas James, him, um, he was enslaved in Canada, Johari, New York. He ends up seeking his freedom. He goes to Canada and then comes back here. And like you heard, helped to start the AME Zion churches. And then not just in Rochester though, but across the state. So he worked with folks in Lockport, in the Syracuse area, in the Ithaca area. In each of these AME Zion churches were spots on the Underground Railroad. So we would call him a freedom seeker. And then really quickly, I'm just going to go through a couple of the examples. Um, I was going to set this all up, and, and I was just doing the most. You know, As a teacher, we want to do all the things and have y'all experience everything. So I'm going to just quickly talk through some of the sources that the kids would see in the gallery walk. So this right here is the Underground Railroad, showing routes, showing that people actually came to Rochester. But then also, I never knew this until we put this together in 2021, that enslaved people also sought their freedom in Mexico. They also went to the Caribbean. That was brand new learning for me. Growing up, I only heard the North, Canada, the North, Canada, versus let's complicate this history a little bit more and tell a little bit more of the story. Or Thomas James, thinking about you know, him being enslaved, but that's not all of who he was. He was also a preacher, an author, an abolitionist. We want students to understand that you are not what has happened to you, that that does not define you that you get to decide who you are, that the, the constraints that are put on you, that's not all of who you are. And if you notice, we don't have anybody in whips, in chains, there's no slave ships. We show people with dignity, with agency on the covers of their autobiographies because we wanna show the humanity piece of it. Thinking about Sojourner Truth and her actually, you know, her young son being sold away at five years old. And then students find out the next day that she's the first African-American woman to win a lawsuit, and she actually wins her son back from enslavement. And so each, as they go through this, um, this unit, each day they learn a little bit more and a little bit more. Harriet Tubman, got to have Harriet Tubman in there. You know, OG, got to have her in there. Like, she's just the you know, amazing woman. Uh, but then also, this was really surprising, that over half of our senators were enslavers. So we're moving away from individuals and thinking about the systems that were in power. You know, Daniel Penfield, Horatio Gates, Nathaniel Rochester were allowed to enslave people because it was the law in the state until 1827. And those men passed the Gradual Emancipation Act, what's hard to see here, but they could have freed enslaved children in 1799, but chose to keep them enslaved for almost another 30 years. So then slavery didn't end here in 18, until 1827 that our city is named after an enslaver, that our county is named after an enslaver, that at one point we had over 20,000 people enslaved right here in New York State. The names of people, this is the census data, the names of people who were enslaved um, and the names of the enslavers too. 
that people fought back and they did not always win. We have to make sure that we're telling the stories, not just the exceptionalist stories of the, the people that won, that were triumphant. We also have to tell the narratives that people fought because a lot of times people fought and they didn't win. Right? Students are going to fight for issues that they have today, and they might not win that first battle or the second, but it's still important that they fight and they stand up for what they believe in. That Nathaniel Rochester, before he came to Rochester, he was a sheriff in Maryland, and he would hunt freedom seekers, and he would pocket the money, and he used some of that money to buy the land um, of Rochesterville. Or that not every black person was enslaved in this country. At the same time that slavery was going on, there were also free black settlers that existed as well. So there were communities of people that were not enslaved, like Asa Dunbar. He was the first free black settler in the Rochester area. And then we end this day by asking students, you know, if you can only pick two sources to tell a friend about who wasn't here about what enslavement was like, what would you choose? You know, what would you tell your friend about? And then we end this day by asking them how they're feeling. We always want to check in with students and say, you know, how are you feeling about what we're learning? You know, are you in the blue zone? This is called the zones of regulation. And so we want to find out if, you know, are kids upset about what they're learning? Are they worried? Are they, you know, grateful? Are they getting a little sad about it? And we don't have to shy away from these feelings. You know, a lot of the criticisms that we hear is like, you're going to make our kids feel guilty. And it's not about feeling guilty at all. It's about saying, you know, you can be upset looking at that. I'm upset too. Frederick Douglass was upset too. And thinking about this quote, he says, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. We can take our feelings and we can let them drive us to do something, to create change in the community and to see what we want to see. So I'm going to stop there. So if y'all have any questions, but like I said, I've got like 45 other slides, <laughs> probably more than that. Um, but this, the next part is going into our redlining unit, which goes into like the 60s and things like that. So I'll make sure that Judith has this and we can share this out to y'all. But I definitely want to be mindful of time and open up the space for questions that you have for Justin or myself. Um, so thank you for <laughs> participating. So yeah, we'd love to open it up. Any questions that folks have? I have something I want to say before yeah. uh, we go. I want to introduce the equality. It's part of the, the partnership. Oh, sorry. Part of the partnership of the 1816 House and the Quabla and the Frederick Douglass family are doing involves first-person interpretation by a of people who will come to your own classroom. And I'd like to introduce, let's see, uh, Harriet Tubman. <laughs> from here. Uh, Anna Murray Douglas, a.k.a. Shirley Strother. So we're truth. three years, bless you, for the last three years we've partnered with University of Rochester and they've done our evaluation so I can also share that with Judy um, as well. We are um, getting, we have a, a new evaluator that we're just getting in the data from this past school year but for the last three years we absolutely have that. Um, the impact in last year our focus was about going into, I think we went into 20 different classrooms across the community to really see how students were interpreting that. So that's in our year three evaluation, so I'll make sure that we share that with you all as well. But overwhelmingly positive responses. Um, if you notice like how engaged y'all are, we're talking and turning exactly what happens in the classroom with students. And um, this, what we're hearing from teachers is that the students are, especially students after they go through the enslavement unit, are like, I want to go to Africa. Like, like I had, this, this is like students out in Pittsburgh, 
fourth graders that learned it and they were like, we want to go to Africa. Like, we want to see these things. And I was like, that is so awesome. Mm -hmm. Even like some students at Wheatland Chai Lai, they were quizzing me. Like, I, I came into their class to talk about this. They're like, well, did you know this, 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 and this? We learned about Africa. And I was like, no, tell me more. <laughs> I put the unit together, but I don't know. It, tell me more. Because they were so excited about it. Um, so, a little off track, but yes, we do have evaluations and we'll make sure you have that. Um, so we have most of our units of study are five days long and so um, and they all align if you notice we don't have something for every single grade level right now because we intentionally choose um, units that fit within the social studies and the ELA standards for New York State because um, nowhere in the state can they mandate curriculum um, districts individual districts get to choose and so but they all have to align with New York State standards so what we did was we chose standards so that students so teachers didn't have to say well, I don't have time to teach that, or that doesn't fit in. This actually is something you're supposed to be teaching in this grade level, and now you have exemplar units that you can use. Um, so, so most of them are five days, a couple of them are three days long. Say that one more time. So that's the next part that I didn't get a chance to get into. That's our redlining unit. So we talk about the, um, got some slides here. I told you I have way too many slides. It's in here. We talk about it in redlining. Um, but yes, we do touch on that in um, eighth and twelfth grade. Mm -hmm. Yes? So right now there's only two suburban communities that don't work with us out of the 21 complete districts. So um, it, we're pretty overwhelmingly some schools um, it's mandated that this curriculum is being taught. Um, other schools, we've just had just maybe initial engagements with them, but there's literally just one school that we have not been able to connect with. Um, but most other schools have us come in. We offer free trainings and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So if we're in Greece, then they're going to have some stuff that ha focuses on Greece history, and so we'll embed that piece in there. If we're in Hilton, we talk about Hilton. If we're in, you know, anywhere we're at. We, we tailor whatever we're talking about to that district. Mm -hmm. um, we did, so I would say in 2020, uh, we got quite a bit of pushback. A lot of, um, probably saw the school board meetings, 2020 into 2021 school year. Um, the school board meeting fights and all those things, that, that was our curriculum they were fighting over. Um, and what we realized is that people will make assumptions versus um, sitting down and actually experiencing it. And once we actually have people go through it, they're like, oh, so you're not telling my kid what to think. You're not saying my kid is bad because they're white. You're not make it shaming my kid like you're literally asking them what are they noticing what are they wondering what questions are coming up and that usually like squashes any kind of issues or pushback um, I would say the second year so 2021 into 2022 school year teachers started self-censoring because they were afraid of being like blasted on social media or things like that and so it's just we had to encourage teachers and just remind them like you are professionals and most of them with master's degrees because it's mandated in New York State to get a master's degree. Um, you know what you're doing and we have to do what's best for all children. I know the focus today has been on black children but this curriculum is for every single child in our community because every single child is going to grow up and they're going to be a global citizen. So we need to prepare them to learn about people who are different than them. So that's been a thing, like in the rural area, sometimes they're like, well, we don't have black and brown kids here. So we don't need, like, no, 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 no. You still need, because this is not black history. This is New York State history. So all kids need to learn this history. It's New York State history. So I'll give you my card afterwards, um, and then you can absolutely reach out to us because we're always um, bringing in more research and thinking about right now, um, 
we're a very small team. There's three of us on our team that do this full time. And so we're starting to grow our team. And so we'll have a, a couple more folks that'll be added onto our team soon. And so we'll have the capacity to do a little bit more research and things like that. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Yes, we absolutely would love to have that. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I'll give you my card before we leave. So there's a small team of three of you. Uh -huh. So I'm assuming that you train, train the teachers who will deliver this yes. curriculum. Yep. In the city of Rochester, is this curriculum available or would be used in all the schools? Um, no, each school is different. Some schools are going a lot deeper than other schools, um, especially with the reconfiguration right now of like so many schools closing this year and opening. Um, but we do have, with specific schools, we have individual contracts for the entire year. Um, there are some principals that are like, I want to go deeper with this, like this is great, but I need more. And so they've actually cr contracted with us to, to go to their grade level meetings to coach their teachers and things like that. So the other part of the work is not just us delivering professional development, we also do coaching. Um, and capacity building as well. Um, I want to say yes. Our goal is to eventually move across the, the country. That is the goal. Um, but we are we need to get some big funding to be able to hire a, a robust team of folks that can actually at the level that we do this work because one of the feed the pieces of feedback we get is our approach and how we do this and so to be able to hire um, and provide high quality professional development but also high quality coaching has been really important. So it's finding the right people that are in the right place in their life to be able to step into this role and do this work. But yes, that is our plan eventually. Um, we want to get through New York State first um, and then we're starting to move into the New York City area very slowly. It's a huge, that's a huge area. So <laughs> we're slowly starting to move down state um, but really thinking about how we're um, deepening our work here in Rochester and then also Buffalo and Syracuse. So we've been doing quite a bit of work in Syracuse the last couple of years and we just moved into Buffalo last year. And so we're starting to, we, want to, we have to build relationships in these communities for people to trust us, for them to let us come work with them. So that's been the, a little bit of an obstacle when we move outside of Rochester because we have connections and relationships built here versus us being outsiders coming into a different community and having to earn the trust of folks in the community. Uh-huh. Yeah, we're busy. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> we are busy. We have been working, working, working. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry that Chester Freeman from Rochester Quaker meeting couldn't be here today for health reasons. He's worked so hard to help people in Canandaigua, especially Mm -hmm. Reacquaint themselves or discover for the first time Austin Stewart's story mm -hmm. yeah. until Chester Freeman drew our attention to the fact that Austin Stewart is buried in Canada. Well, I never heard of him. Mm -hmm. I was educated in one of the best school districts in the Finger Lakes. Uh -huh. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, Justin, what would Frederick Douglass make of all that we've been hearing and learning today? <laughs> oh, thanks for giving me the easy one. <laughs> um, you know, Keisha said something that I think is important. We we all observed that uncomfortable period in 2020, 21, 22, when there was such, and it continues, but such vocal, violent pushback against this, this stuff, against the, the notion that um, our kids, you know, so I, I grew up in Penfield, um, and I, I don't remember, I assume at some point somebody told me that there is a guy named Daniel Penfield who founded the town, and he was like one of those old white guys with a portrait that we like respect and whatever. I'm certain nobody ever told me that he enslaved people. And so like that to some is a controversial notion that we need to know all of that stuff. And it can be disheartening when that's what you see on the news is that there's a thousand people are at a school board meeting protesting against this curriculum or, or whatever it is. And, 
And what I say to people is that that energy, that oppositional energy is not new. That's always been there. And it, it flares up at times when there's progress. When somebody, when some people get together and put in a lot of work and say, no, this is important. Just like there was opposition when, when Frederick Douglass said, no, the kids should be able to go to the public schools. Or when Fight said, no, we do need to have a, a comprehensive curriculum for, for black students. Um, and so I think of it almost as like a fever, you know, like the, the fact that you're getting pushback can be positive feedback. Uh, and I think that that's something that Frederick Douglass would really appreciate is that if you're just kind of like marching along and nobody's saying anything, well, you might not be going anywhere. You might be like lost out in the woods somewhere. had too much interactions with the unions and honestly we also it all depends on us with the school boards too so some districts we've actually presented to their school boards other districts we've just met with the assistant um, superintendent of instruction and they look at this work and they say this is great work and we're just gonna bring you in so there are some schools that we don't even have to deal with the school board because we've got people that see the quality of this um, they, we explain how we, we present it and teach it, and then they just bring us right in. Because right now, because we're grant funded by all the local foundations here, all the work we do in local schools is for free. I forgot to say that. Um, so right now, we are able to offer the trainings, the coaching, the capacity building to schools for free, um, and then consistently offer that support as well. So not too much pushback, but we're, also, we're always asking and advocating for school boards to see what we're doing so that they're also in the know. Um, and then if there are questions that come up, they've experienced it. And normally we do, we do three hour trainings where we actually go through all of it and have people go through the different pieces. Um, I didn't even get to the point where we have uh, these jigsaw stories because we always pair stories of resistance with the inequities that are faced and we always uplift local folks. So like Dr. Alice Holloway Young, Dr. Cooper, um, Roberto Burgos, Nydia Padilla, we uplift these folks in the community to tell their stories and how they fought back. Um, so that's another piece of the curriculum. Yeah. I want, there, if you don't already receive the 1816 electronic newsletter, make sure we have your email so that we can follow up and send some of the resources we've been learning about. I just, if I can just say one last thing. Somebody asked about the, the response to the curriculum, and I'm not, I'm not in, involved with the organization, but I... I talk to a lot of kids who have been through that, and I, t and I do presentations on my book. And, and what I would say I observe is, is two things that they come out of it with. Well, three things. And, and the easiest one is like they know more historical facts. Like that's the old, like you know, Judy said, like history is a story and like you read it and then you can go to sleep at night, fine, whatever. They learn this stuff. I, the more important things are, number one, they, um, they see themselves as, as critical consumers of history. History is not just 
you know, like you learn the rules of multiplication, whatever, but history is different. You're in history, you're a consumer of history, you have critical thought about it. And, and I see kids today who I'm so impressed by the way that they naturally analyze information that they get. And they, they bring a skepticism to it, which as a journalist I, I find to be very healthy. Um, and the second thing is that they see agency for themselves. History is not just the story and then it's done. Again, they're in history. So, so the, the tactics and, and the actions that other people have taken are something that's applicable in their own lives with whatever their things are. Mm -hmm. And when I contrast that to um, the, the education that I got, I assume the education that a lot of us got, it's, it's so heartening to see the way that kids, and not just black kids, but all kids, are seeing themselves in our history as a community. It's really very inspiring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's offer it to welcome Damien Spindler, who's our fabulous videographer, so that this presentation will be up on the 1816 Farmington Meeting House for everyone. Pass it around, and let's um, help people really begin to use this material. Yes, Reverend May. Anyone who's interested, there will be a presentation on the stained glass windows if you want to so Yes, a little tour right after this. Oh, oh great. great. Let's do it. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. And help yourself to uh, refresh things if you'd like to stay around and talk a bit. And one more thanks to Memorial Lane Design Church for hosting.